Topic No. 1. Four nights ago, on Thursday, January 17, millions of Americans tuned in the ABC television program 2020. The program that night presented a heavily edited interview by the British television personality David Frost. The person interviewed was said to be the former Shah of Iran. The individual we saw in the David Frost interview looked, sounded, and acted very much like the Shah, but he looked much healthier than the sickly-looking Shaw in New York two months ago. This was true even though news reports had been saying the Shaw's condition was deteriorating. Almost every time he answered a question, the face became expressionless and the eyes froze into a glassy stare. He spoke slowly, haltingly, as if groping around in a fuzzy memory to find the answers. And time after time he just gave up and said simply, I don't remember that. Later that same evening ABC presented its nightly special on the Iran Crisis. The program began with some follow-up discussion of the David Frost interview program. Dr. Joseph Sisko, former Under Secretary of State, was among those asked for his reactions to the interview. Sisko appeared to be shaken by what he had seen. He said the Shaw he knew had always been able to discuss the intricacies of geopolitics not only as they affect the Persian Gulf, but worldwide. By contrast, the man he saw in the David Frost interview was, quote, uncertain in his speech, a completely different man from the one I knew, unquote. My friends, Dr. Sisko could not have been more right. The individual interviewed by David Frost in Panama was not the Shaw at all. In fact, he was not even a human being. It was a kind of living robot known as a synthetic automaton, or more briefly, a synthetic. I first revealed last October 1979 in AUDIO LETTER No. 51 that synthetics were beginning to appear on the scene. They are being deployed as a tool of intrigue by the warlike Bolsheviks here in the United States. They are the Bolshevik answer to another type of biological robot which the Russians began deploying earlier in 1979. The Russian type is known as an organic robotoid, and I first made them public in AUDIO LETTER No. 46 last May. Both the Russian robotoids and the Bolshevik synthetics are remarkable creatures. They are manufactured by radically different technologies, but they have one thing in common. They are both artificial life forms which live and breathe but have to be programmed like computers, and they are the products of three decades of spectacular scientific discoveries out of public view. I have given a little of the scientific background in AUDIO LETTERS No. 47 and 51, but robotoids and synthetics remain perhaps the most secret of all intelligence weapons. In my previous tapes about these biological robots, I have mentioned that their most critical feature is their biological computer brain. In that regard, the Russian robotoids are far superior to the Bolshevik synthetics. That's because of their holographic brain, which I described in detail in AUDIO LETTER No. 47. In AUDIO LETTER No. 51 I mentioned the low brain quality of the synthetics, and if you were watching the alleged Shah of Iran, in the David Frost interview the other night, you saw a perfect example with your own eyes. Synthetics easily pass for human beings, but they act dull-witted compared to the humans which they simulate. When David Frost interviewed the synthetic double for the former Shaw, he no doubt thought he was talking with the real thing, but by that time the real Shaw had been dead for well over a month. He died in the early morning hours of Sunday, December 2, 1979. In AUDIO LETTER No. 52 last November, I explained why the Shaw had been brought to New York City in the first place. He did undergo medical treatment, but that could have been done elsewhere. The once mighty Shaw arrived in New York as a mere pawn in a deadly worldwide game of chess. For more than two years a secret war has been in progress between the new rulers of Russia and the overthrown former rulers of Russia, the Bolsheviks. 
Having been expelled from Russia by the tens of thousands, the old Bolsheviks have been flocking mainly here to the United States. They are in a rage to strike back at Russia, and they plan to do it using America's military power. Over the past two years and more, a sophisticated new Bolshevik Revolution has been underway without fanfare here in the United States. I've kept my listeners informed about this situation in past AUDIO LETTERS. The Bolsheviks are in a do-or-die frenzy to throw America's military might at Russia, and in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 for August 1978 I revealed how they plan to do it. The Bolshevik war plan is based on an American nuclear first strike against Russia, and the chain of events to lead up to the first strike was to begin with a crisis over Iran. That is what I made public nearly a year and a half ago, and that is what is going on now, right before our very eyes. My friends, we are on the road to NUCLEAR WAR ONE. In AUDIO LETTER No. 52 I explained the purpose for which the former Shah of Iran was lured to New York City in late October. This was a Russian ploy carried out using their own robotoid replacements for certain powerful Americans. They had discovered that the Bolsheviks here in America were setting in motion the dreaded Iran crisis. It was already too late for the Russians to prevent the crisis from erupting, so instead they maneuvered the Shah here in a preemptive strategy to change the course of the crisis. I gave the details of all this in AUDIO LETTER No. 52, so I won't repeat it again here. The Russian maneuvers involving the former Shah of Iran were set in motion while the Kremlin Peace Faction the White Doves were still calling the shots. They succeeded in their plan to make the former Shah the center of the Iran crisis contrary to the Bolshevik plans, and later, when the time was ripe, they were planning to use their control over the Shah to make the crisis fizzle out. But as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 52, the Russians had their hands full in trying to sort out the Iran crisis. The Shah's trip to New York City was arranged on short notice. Having accomplished that much, the Russians put the Shah on ice during November 1979 while they concentrated on other pressing aspects of the crisis. As December 1979 began, Russian agents here in the United States were preparing for new moves involving the Shah. For over five weeks the Shah had been holding court and receiving medical treatment at the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center in New York City. His suite on the 17th floor was walled off by a special barricade of bulletproof glass. Everything having to do with the Shah was subject to intensive security precautions. Unknown to the Shah himself, he was the key to Russia's plan to unravel the Iranian crisis without war. So the one thing the Russians could not afford was to have something happen to the Shah at that time. By the time I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 52 on November 30, 1979, plans were being laid to move the Shah. The Russians had begun to penetrate the Bolshevik stranglehold on Iran and were establishing a dialogue with the Khomeini Government. The time had come to remove the Shah from the hospital. The advance preparations at the hospital were subtle, but not subtle enough. They were detected by Bolshevik agents within the hospital and they were successful in learning the details of the plan to move the Shah before it took place. Shortly after 4 a.m. on the morning of December 2, 1979, the Shah left his hospital room in a wheelchair. He was accompanied by armed guards, including FBI agents brandishing submachine guns. They entered an elevator on the 17th floor of the hospital and went down to the sub-basement. From there the Shaw and his guards traveled along an underground tunnel to the Payson House staff residence on East 71st Street. There the Shaw's party entered a parking garage. The Shaw was wheeled up to a blue-green FBI van. The Shaw was helped out of his wheelchair and into the van. As soon as the Shaw was inside, the doors of the van were shut and the van started moving. As it did so, three FBI cars joined up as an escort. The four-vehicle motorcade drove carefully toward the exit of the parking garage. 
As they did so, one of the Shaw's guards in the van pulled out a powerful gun equipped with a silencer. He and the other guards in the Shaw's van turned out to be Bolshevik synthetics. By the time the Shaw's van reached the exit of the parking garage, the Shaw's body lay slumped on the floor inside. Like his former patron Nelson Rockefeller, the Shaw had died of a single bullet to the forehead. The other synthetics in the front of the van did exactly as programmed. They drove on as if nothing had happened. FBI agents in the other cars detected no hint that anything was wrong. The motorcade drove the rest of the way to LaGuardia Airport without incident. Only when the van was opened at the airport was it discovered what had taken place. News reports that day and the next were filled with headlines about the Shaw's mysterious move to Texas. On television we were shown an Air Force DC-9 taking off in the darkness at LaGuardia. We were told that the Shaw was aboard, but he was not. His body was kept in a remote location at New York's LaGuardia Airport until around 6 p.m. that evening, after which it was flown to a southern state for disposal. When the DC-9 was shown landing at the air base in Texas, we were told again it was the Shaw's plane. Normally Lackland Air Force Base is unrestricted, but the air base was suddenly closed after the plane landed. There was confusion. Initially Air Force officials at the base said there would be a press conference that afternoon, but soon they reversed themselves. They not only canceled the press conference, but told all reporters to leave the base immediately or be forcibly ejected. The public relations plans which had been made ahead of time just fell apart. Instead, a cover-up was hastily set in motion on orders from certain Russian agents in the Pentagon. In the days that followed, all was mystery concerning the Shaw. He was said to be in certain hospital quarters at Lackland, but as days passed and no one saw the Shaw, questions began to multiply. Had it been suspected that the Shaw was already dead, the Bolshevik agents holding the American hostages in Tehran might have killed the hostages, and that could have led very quickly to a nuclear war. Meanwhile the Bolsheviks here in America were preparing to take control of the Shaw controversy. The Bolshevik synthetics are programmed by a technique completely different from that used by the Russians with their Robotoids. It is not as good but it also does not require a cerebral hologram. Bolshevik agents in New York had been able to obtain the genetic samples needed, and on Saturday, December 15, there was a new surprise regarding the Shaw. He was said to have left Texas that morning for a small island off Panama. Then the invisible Shaw seemingly reappeared in the form of a synthetic, and since that time the Shaw's image has been utilized by the Bolsheviks. As I told you earlier, it was a synthetic that was seen in the David Frost television interview four nights ago. What happened to the late Shaw of Iran is only part of a much larger pattern of recent days. The Bolshevik deployment of synthetics began in earnest three months ago, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 51. As a byproduct of this, Bizarre cattle mutilations are once again taking place in North America. A few years ago there was a rash of these incidents in the western United States. At that time the earliest large-scale experiments were underway with synthetics. Now, after a lull, the synthetics are being deployed operationally, and the cattle mutilations have resumed. Right now, however, they are taking place primarily in Canada to minimize attention to them here in the United States. My friends, the cattle mutilations are nothing more than a modern twist on cattle rustling. The synthetic process uses certain glands and tissues of cattle as raw material, as I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 51. To obtain these raw materials, the cattle involved have to be destroyed in a very wasteful manner. So the Bolshevik agents who are manufacturing synthetics do not use their own cattle. Instead, they let others suffer the losses involved in slaughtered herds. The cattle mutilations may turn into an epidemic that is too big to ignore, 
because during the past three months the Bolshevik circles have started deploying synthetics in great numbers. A covert war of biological robots is now raging worldwide between the Russians and their old Bolshevik enemies. The Russians got a head start by deploying their robotoids first last spring, but they knew their advantage would not last long, and they tried to use it fast to nail down approval of the SALT II Treaty. Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko summed it up last June 25, 1979. In an unprecedented two-hour news conference in Moscow, he paused at one point and said simply, FANTASTIC SITUATION. My friends, the dangers we face now are fantastic, but so was aerial warfare until World War I, the atomic bomb until World War II, and moon flight until Project Apollo. The Bolsheviks in our midst are obsessed with their schemes for revolution and war, rule or ruin. Using their synthetics, they are fast regaining the power they were losing at the hands of Russia's robotoids. Unlike the Russians, the Bolsheviks have an entrenched power base here in the United States, and so the Russians are now losing the invisible war of the biological robots. With every day that their power increases, the Bolsheviks here in America redouble their frenzy to seize still more power. To advance their revolution here, the Bolsheviks are gradually shutting down America. Tremors are shaking our economic system, and the United States dollar is awaiting the moment of collapse. In April 1974, I gave a warning in Congressional testimony about plans which were being laid for a gold skyrocket. I testified that the plan called for gold to streak upward past $2,000 per ounce, and I described how this was tied to the secret theft of America's monetary gold supply by international forces. I later offered to present evidence and witnesses under oath, but Congress was not interested. Then I went public with my warnings, but lies and maneuvers by the United States Treasury Department were swallowed like honey by most Americans. So nothing lasting was done to stop the plan for our economic destruction. Now the gold skyrocket is a matter of daily headlines. Since I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 52 less than two months ago, the price of gold has more than doubled. Gold auctions by the gold-poor United States Treasury have stopped, as I alerted you they would in December of 1978. AUDIO LETTER No. 41 Thousands of people are lining up to turn in their gold and silver, thinking they are receiving good dollars in exchange. But that's because the dollar is still being propped up artificially. When the time is ripe in Bolshevik plans, the props will be pulled out and the dollar will crash. The dollar is on the road to repudiation, which will make it worthless, and many of the wealthy abroad now believe that the United States does not have the gold it claims to have. The very few who do know about the plan to repudiate the dollar are not selling their gold and silver. They are holding on to it and even buying more. As the Bolsheviks press ahead in taking control of the United States, they are also working overtime to get ready for war. They want to destroy Russia, and they want you and me to do their dirty work. They already know that Nuclear War I will kill three out of every four Americans, but that does not worry them. Using their positions of privilege and power here in America, they believe they will survive so they can't wait to throw the United States into nuclear war against Russia. When I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 52 last November 30, the official line we were hearing daily was that Muslim students were holding our hostages in Tehran. Those stories were lies, and I told you so. The situation in the Embassy is controlled by Bolshevik agents. They are not true Muslims at all and are beyond the control of Ayatollah Khomeini. Now more than a month later you're hearing a distorted echo of what I told you then. It is now being admitted that Ayatollah Khomeini does not control those 
who are holding our hostages, but you are being fed only half-truths designed to rally your support for war. Thirteen days ago, on January 8, 1980, a synthetic double for our late President Carter said, quote, The most powerful single political entity in Iran consists of the international terrorists or the kidnappers who are holding our hostages, unquote. but their Bolshevik ties are not mentioned. Instead, you are being given the impression that they may be Russian-inspired in some manner. Two months ago all Iranians were being lumped together, and the Bolsheviks were whipping up Americans into hating them all, but now we are suddenly hearing about the threat to Iran from Russia. We are being prepared for war with decorations that we may have to defend Iran militarily. The Bolshevik military strategy remains as I described it nearly a year and a half ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 37. I will now repeat word for word the warning I gave you then. The American public will demand that it is time for the United States to stand up to Russia, and with full public support American troops and weapons will pour into Iran. From that point onward the outbreak of NUCLEAR WAR ONE will be all but impossible for the public to follow by way of the so-called news.